Turn on my toy and make sure it's working. It is. Yay. So. Well, I'm glad Scott's back. <laughs> but I wish he was up here. So, anyway, I'm glad you had a wonderful time with your grandchildren and, uh, and your son and, and the rest of them, your daughter-in-law and all those. But, uh, uh, anyway, as I stand up here this morning, uh, one thought seems to dominate my mind. <laughs> what am I doing up here? <laughs> Uh, as many of you know, I, I teach a Sunday school class on Sunday mornings, uh, but this is different, a lot different. But I want you to understand that I feel woefully inadequate to preach a sermon, especially given that I'm filling in for a pastor and a man of God that I deeply admire. So what were you thinking? <laughs> it's all good. I'm not done yet. Wait. <laughs> Anyway, I did talk to Scott before he left, and I gave him a glimpse of what I was going to do this morning, and, uh, and he said, okay. So it's his fault. <laughs> it remains to be seen if this will work out, so I'll let you be the judge on that. But uh, Being a teacher on uh, Sunday mornings uh, has given me a much deeper understanding of how God uses inadequate people to fulfill his plans. I rest my case. <laughs> I know that my own understanding of Scripture has increased since I started teaching. And because of that, I find that there are some things that I want so desperately to convey to you, things that Scripture reveals to us. I wish that I could make a clear case for trusting in Christ, because it is so clear. I think of Noah. Now, here's a guy that follows God faithfully, right? Right? in spite of the rampant sin and the depravity that's all around him. And because of that, God uses him to build an ark to save his family, as no one else cares or believes that the world is going to be flooded, wiping out all unprotected life on the planet. And Noah has to deal with all the jeers and all the taunts and all the verbal abuse and stays true to the task that God has given him. Mankind is destroyed because of their sin. And Jesus speaks about Noah in Matthew 24, verses 36 through 39. No one, or but concerning that day and that hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would have not let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of God, Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. So what is the climate of our world today? I only need to say a few words. Transgenderism, same-sex marriage, abortion at any time. People are walking away from God, from faith, from belief, and from salvation. We are beginning to see a world where there are people that have never, ever been told about Jesus, about grace, about forgiveness, and about mercy. Several years ago, I was at a conference that uh, there was a man there named Ray Comfort uh, who was speaking. I have not forgotten the passion from which he spoke or the love that he conveyed to those that are lost. Ray has a ministry called Living Waters, and this ministry has been reaching out to young and old people 
for many years, especially where there are young people. Campuses, beaches, places like that. And several years ago, he produced a uh, short movie that explained Noah and the hope that we have in Christ. I've referenced this movie numerous times when, I'm, when I've been talking to others about the last days. So, while I was preparing this sermon, I realized that as a teacher, not a preacher, a teacher, <laughs> I could bring this information to you as I would my class. So, welcome to class. <clears throat> so, I just need to show you. So, this is how class works. You watch, and then we talk. I'd like you to watch this short video. There's a man named Noah, like in the Bible? Right now. Well, the Bible Noah? No, I do not believe he existed. So you don't think he built an ark? No, no. I'm very comfortable with my atheism, but I support myths. You think God sent a flood and drowned the whole world? No. <laughs> you don't? No. If he had, would it have been fair to do so? Oh, uh, no. Why would he do that? Uh, well, the Bible says because the heart of man was corrupt, his imaginations were continually evil, and there was great wickedness and violence on the earth. Do you think that's justification for wiping out the whole of humanity, except for Noah and his family? No. Noah, born over 2,700 years BC, was a shipbuilder and a prophet of the century. Many think of Noah and the ark as a story from the past, but did you know that according to Jesus, the events surrounding the life of Noah are directly related to you? Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be with the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, the things that happened in Noah's day will be similar to the things that are going to happen during the time referred to in the Bible as the end of the age. In a moment, you're going to see clearly that the end of the age is happening now. But of all the signs, the one prevalent thing that happened in Noah's day was that people who knew right from wrong chose to ignore Noah's warning of God's coming judgment, such as the way of the 21st century. Do you think there was a man named Noah like in the Bible? I did for a long time. I don't right now. Uh, I believe there was a man named Noah. Do you think he built an ark? I'm pretty sure that that's kind of a story. Do you think there was a man named Noah like in the Bible? Ah, there's lots of great stories about it. Do you believe there was a, a man named Noah? Um, I believe at one time there was very likely a man named Noah, whether or not he was a biblical figure and swallowed by a whale. I, I find it statistically difficult to believe that nobody's been swallowed by a whale before, so. It's a lot of animals and a little arg. I mean, you're looking at over a million species out there. I don't find it possible. The boat would have to be like the size of the moon. The scriptures call Noah a preacher of righteousness. His life was prophetic in that the ark was a type of the then coming Christ. And we, like Noah, are preachers of righteousness, warning every man, calling a corrupt world to repentance and faith in Jesus, and telling them to be ready for his coming, of which no man knows the hour nor the day. Do you think we're living in the last days? No. No, I don't think so. People said we were going to die in 2012, and we didn't. I believe the whole world is going to come to an end real quickly here. I honestly couldn't care less about when the last days are coming. It'd be nice if the world ended. It's not my concern whether it's tomorrow or a million years from now. Do you know what the signs are of the end of the world? Uh, I know some of them. Tell me, what are they? Chaos. Okay, I'll take that back. Nope, don't care. Some dude in a horse chariot with like a spear, like going down from the heavens. Weather changes. We got wars and rumors of wars. Definitely the last days. The economy's going crazy. I know there's still bad things happening, but I don't think it's enough for the last days to occur. It's very dark right now. Here are 10 major biblical signs for which we are to look. The scriptures tell us there'll be money hungry Bible teachers who would slur the Christian faith and deceive many. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Yeah, name it and claim it, health and wealth. You got it right, baby. You got it right. Lord, let this anointing and power flow through our sister now. I want you to know something. I am a prophet of God. I'll never be broke another day in my life. <laughs> Say it again. 
bad. I want you to make me a cake today. A hundred dollars. What happened to the pay? It's gone. Just shake off that worry. Shake off that sickness. A vow of faith has got to take faith. That's why I say a thousand dollars. People like those um, TV ministries and stuff, they're raking in lots of money. They're driving around in nice fancy cars. They're just bilking people. Taking money from people who follow blindly and profiting from it is something I think is bad. What's the root of all evil? What would you say, Belinda? Money. Money. You think it's money? It's money. Do you think the Bible says that? It does. It doesn't. The love of money. That's right. It's the love of money. It's greed, this root of all evil. Yes, sir. See, Bob, I can't send a hundred dollars. If you can just worship God through five dollars or ten dollars, Every apostle Paul said the first of each week lay aside as God hath prospered you. That's why I believe God prospers people. Satan gave me this mess. I mean, it's a lie of the devil. I shouldn't have said that. The second sign we're looking at is found in Matthew chapter 24. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Birthing pains, earthquakes. Giant locusts. Floods, hurricanes. So you're thinking we could be living in what the Bible could be? Yeah. So do you think this should be a judgment day? No. What about hell? I don't believe in hell. Sign number three, the moon will become blood red. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Well, I'm a skeptic, so, you know, I like to believe, but I'm also a skeptic that believes also. So um, it could. I mean, you always see the moon change in different colors, obviously. Uh, it, it could turn to red. In just over an hour, the full moon will turn a deep red for most of the planet. <laughs> Actually, I've seen the, the moon turn red before, and it has worried me. I was like, you know, what is this? What does it mean? Freak you out? It did freak me out. How would you react if you saw the moon was red, blood red tonight? I would be worried. You'd be worried? Yes, I would. Why? Uh, well, I, in my physical condition, I would think, well, goodness gracious, there's something wrong. Um, I think I need to run and hide and get underneath a rock. You may remember about 10 or so years ago, this little girl named Jessica in Florida was abducted by a man. She was seven years old, cute little thing. He sexually molested her and then buried her alive in a plastic bag. They found her clutching to her teddy bear. If you were the judge, how would you sentence that man? Oh, I would probably, I would probably sentence him to uh, castration and, yeah, death. <laughs> well, that, so you feel strongly about that. <laughs> I do. <laughs> so why do you feel like that? Um, well, that's just, that's like the purest form of evil, what do you think? So in other words, you believe in justice? Um, uh, yeah, I guess so. But I don't believe that we have the right to judge and you just made a judgment. You just made a judgment on an evil act, and I think it was good. It shows you value human life and you care about that little girl. Judgment. I'm not without judgment. Yeah, so what I'm saying is that if, if that's true, if you think such evil should be punished so severely, how much more should God punish a murderer or a rapist? Can you see that? Mm. And God's judgment is a place called hell. That's his, that's his prison and there's no parole. It's eternal. In the last days, blasphemy will become commonplace. Do you go to R-rated movies? Of course. It's the only kind of movies I watch. Have you been to R-rated movies? I've been to X-rated movies. Have you noticed how they use the name of Jesus in blasphemy in movies? Of course. Why don't they use the name of Muhammad in a movie to cuss? Oh, wow. I, don't, I don't talk about religion over interviews. Can you think of anyone in history, a famous person like Napoleon or Shakespeare or Hitler who had their name used as a cuss word? Can you think of anyone? Not at this moment, no. Only Jesus Christ. Why would they use his name as a cast word? I don't know. It's a really good question because I, I, I am guilty of that myself. Martin Scorsese's award-winning movie, The Wolf of Wall Street, received unusual international publicity. The feature film starring Leonardo DiCaprio broke the world record for its liberal use of expletives. The F word was used an average of every 21 seconds, 506 times. The S word, 70 times. God's name was blasphemed 28 times. Do you think Muslims would allow Hollywood to use their prophet's name as a cuss word? No. They respect their prophet and they expect people to. And yet we pay Hollywood to blaspheme the name of Jesus. Agreed. 
Another sign of the end of the age is an increase in acceptance of homosexuality, as there was in the days of Sodom. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. I noticed when I came up, you two were kissing in public. You are obviously gay. Uh, do you often do that in public? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, why wouldn't we? I mean, straight people do it. Everybody does it. If you're in love, you're in love. Nothing wrong with being gay? Uh, no, nah, I mean, you know, as long as they don't push it on other people, you know, people have the choice to, you know, do what they want. In the last days, religious hypocrisy will be prevalent. Their conduct belies the genuineness of their profession. When did you last read your Bibles? This morning. Uh, yeah, this morning at church. You're born again? Yes. Are you a Christian? Yes, sir. Have you been born again? Yes, sir. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I am a Christian. Yes, I am Christian. You love the Lord? Yes, sir. You go to R-rated movies? Um, yes, sir. No, I watch them at home. Yes, I do. What about you? Yeah. And you're a Christian? Yes. What about the sex scenes? Does that worry you? Sure. So you shouldn't go to them? Doesn't mean that we shouldn't go. You guys watch couples make love on movie screens in R-rated movies? Where do well, you don't just go to your ending point on this one? <laughs> of course you watch it. Anybody's gonna watch it. What about you? How do you handle the sex scenes? I, I watch them, but you know. do they bother you? No. You stay for the sex scene? Well, it's always there, so like it's uncomfortable at points. You look the other way, or do you watch? No, I do watch. Uh, I, I mean, I look, I don't look the other way, but yeah. This is a little bit personal, but stay with me. A husband and wife are making love in their bedroom, and they notice the curtains pulled back on the bedroom window, and there's a guy peering through the window at them, having sex. What should they do? Um, call the police. <laughs> call the cops. I would tell my wife, girlfriend, or whoever she is at girlfriend. the time to call. Girlfriend? Yes. Making love on the bed? Your girlfriend? I mean wife. Well, a wife, you know. No, a wife. Well, yeah, wife. Well, uh, outside of sex unless you're married. Yes. You should know, it's in the Bible. You should know this. I know that. <laughs> so you having sex outside of marriage? Yes. Yes. You guys having sex? Yes. <laughs> so you're Christians? Yes. yes. Have you had sex before marriage? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't been married yet, and you know I've had tons of it. Are you a Christian? Yeah, I am a Christian actually. If you're a Christian. You shouldn't support dirty movies. You shouldn't support movies that have blasphemy in them. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Hollywood's nothing but a glorified pimp who provides clientele for America, actors who'll take their clothes off and prostitute themselves for money. Do you think I'm right? Yeah, that's true. Actually, when you put it that way, yeah. yeah. Watching people have sex. Yes. You look at a big window called a screen. He looks through a real window. But what's the difference between you and the guy who's peering through the window? You're trying to justify watching dirty movies. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Bottom line, you shouldn't be doing that, but I do it anyway. Yeah. What's the difference between you looking through a window we call a screen and the guy looking through the window at people? The same thing. <laughs> What's the difference between you and him? I guess nothing. Yeah, there is. You're paying for yours. <laughs> Should a Christian support and pay Hollywood to do that? We sit. You're paying them to do so. No, I pirate all my stuff. <laughs> steal it? No, thou shalt not steal. What do you mean pirate? I don't pay for it. Isn't that stealing? Pirating? Yes. Do you ever ask what God thinks as you sit sitting there watch couples make love? No. Remember Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. That's how high God's standards are. If my making you think... Yeah, you are. What about you? Are you going to keep going to dirty movies and call yourself a Christian? No. So you're going to go to dirty movies from now on? Depends if the movie's good, I'll go watch it. I'm going to go to church right now, so <laughs> I definitely repent again. Are you going to keep going to dirty movies as a Christian? Oh, no. So, no. Not after that. <laughs> you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. Yeah. I'm not talking about your salvation. You don't want to play the hypocrite. Yeah. Does this make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, it makes sense. After this talk, I see the point, you know, it really, I have to step it up in my faith and what I believe in, and I should really stop. The Bible claims that in the last days, people will deny that God created the heavens and that he judged the world through Noah's flood. Okay, so you're an atheist, so you believe that nothing created everything, which is scientifically impossible. Well, I believe that we came from a black hole, yes. Do you believe there was a worldwide catastrophic flood? No, I do not. 70% of the earth is covered in water. Yes. Where did it come from? 
That's a good question. That's Do you know? I have no clue at all. How did the uh, water come here? You mean from the original Earth when it was formed? Well, they, they, they the scientists uh, have projected it possibly from um, comets. What's your credentials? Uh, I'm a professor of geology and oceanography at Cal State University, Long Beach. Um, Rick, where do oceans come from? Well, the oceans are constantly changing, but originally the water on the Earth came from a couple different sources. One is that the materials that accumulated in the very early stages of the Earth, sort of as meteorites and asteroid bombardments, had water in them, and as they heated up, they melted, they gave off gases and water vapor, and that condensed to form a lot of water in the Earth. But another way that they came in is that a lot of the stuff that came and accumulated in the, um, in the uh, planet to form the Earth was, were comets, and comets are made up largely of water ice and methane ice. So comets bomb out of the Earth, and all the water came from comets? Um, a lot of the water came from comets. Uh, is it just a theory, or is it a fact, a well-known fact? Well, it's nothing about the origin of the Earth as a fact. <laughs> it was long, long, long time ago. You're a, a science teacher. Yes. Do you think comets brought water to the Earth? <laughs> No? No. Here's a question. Where did all the fish come from? There are 28,000 different species of fish, and then there's whales and dolphins and, uh, and uh, all these different sorts of fish. Do they come on the comets? That's a silly question. Where did they come from? I don't understand what a silly question that is. Well, the oceans is... What, you, you're talking, you, th you think that animals are riding in on comets through the vacuum of space? No, no, I don't... I don't question. I don't believe that, but where did all the fish come from? There are 28,000 different species of fish in the oceans. Do you have any I'm doing it now. I'm coming to experts. That's... Um, you need to do your homework before you talk to experts. I have. Well, nobody knows exactly how and when life started on Earth, but it's entirely possible that the early prebiotic material, or even the first microbes, traveled to Earth aboard a, a rock of some kind and seeded the once barren ground with what would later become every species alive today. Okay, well, thank you for talking to me. The world is covered with water. Water doesn't dissipate. You know, that, that's, that's what nature says. If evaporates, comes down. Evaporates, comes down. Always stays the same. So if there's a worldwide flood, water should still be hanging around somewhere. Do you think 70% of the Earth being covered in water is a good clue that there was a worldwide flood? Oh, whoa. Well, he makes a good point. That's an excellent point, actually. Yeah, it's... Um, yeah, I mean, it's clear. I, I mean, I have a raging clue that possibly... That, that's an excellent point. Maybe it is a, a, a realization that the existence of a clue of a flood. Water. We can't live without it. Neither can dogs, frogs, cats, bats, rats or gnats, or trees or fleas or bees, nor can the horse, of course. We swim in it, we wash in it, we play in it, and for fish, they'll die if they don't stay in it. We clean with it and we cook in it. It's in our tea, our coffee and our milk in our tears, in our blood, and in our mouth. Water is the perfect combination of oxygen and hydrogen. Together, they make thirst-quenching and life-giving water. So, where did it all come from? The Smithsonian Magazine says, water is so vital to our survival, but strangely enough, we don't know the first thing about it. Literally, the first. Where does water, a giver and taker of life on planet Earth, come from? Think about it. There's no possible way in which, like, they were able to fit every species of animals on Earth into that boat. Completely impossible to have two of every species on a boat. It's impossible. It does seem impossible. When it comes to Noah and his ark, two relevant questions arise. How many animals did it carry, and how large was the ark? See if you can spot the repetition of a particular word that skeptics dislike. Of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. Genesis 6, 20. That's right, it's the dreaded word kind, that archaic word that the dictionary defines as a class or group of individual objects, people, animals, etc., of the same nature or character or classified together because they have traits in common. It's a despised word because it means that God didn't have to get today's approximately 
million species to fit into the ark. It means Noah needed only one pair for the canine kind, from which would come all the species of dog, from the Chihuahua to the Great Dane, and one pair for the feline kind, from which would come the domesticated cat and the tiger, etc. So now we're talking just thousands of animals, not millions. And because these animals need not have been fully grown, averaging the size of a sheep, it becomes possible. Another consideration is the size of the ark. It wasn't the little rubber ducky bobbing boat portrayed in kids' cartoons. It was a massive three-level ship, the size of one and a half football fields. Another argument skeptics have against the worldwide flood is that there's not enough water on the earth to cover the highest mountains. They forget that mountains were not the height they are now, and that the earth and the sky store trillions of tons of water. The Bible says that the flood waters came from both the sky and the earth. All the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. Genesis 7:11. The end of the age will be marked by fear of the future. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. Are you fearful of the future? Oh, of course. Are you fearful of the future? Yes. The planet's only getting worse and worse, to be honest. I mean, I see it happen day by day. And... Are you fearful of the future for humanity? Definitely. <laughs> Are you afraid of the future? Terrified. In the last days, scoffers will mock the second coming by claiming that these signs have always been around. Where is the promise of his coming? I can't say that we're living at the end of the age because that's, that's been talked about for so many years. They've been saying that for I don't know how many years. All that stuff's been going on all along. These signs have always been around. People interpret things the way that they would like to. Do you think we're seeing those in today's society? I think we're not only seeing it in today's society, I think we've been seeing it since society began. We live in a world as Noah did, where people are ignoring the warning of the gospel. They're eating, drinking, marrying, and given in marriage. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be? Would you please think about this, or have you got a closed mind? Uh, no, the thing is, I don't think that those things are all that serious. And, you know, if God thinks they're serious, you know, so be it. Have I embarrassed you at all? No, no, I'm not embarrassed. Okay, I well, just... I appreciate you listening. <laughs> what I'm going to do is change gears a little. Oh, very good. Can you handle it? I can handle changing gears, yes. Are you a good person? Like, ethically? Yeah, morally. I like to think so. I think so. What about you? I've done some <laughs> the but I think I have a good thing going on with the big man up top. How many lies have you told in your life? Thousands. What about you? A lot. I've told a lot of lies. Oh, <laughs> I have no idea. You just blasphemed God's name. Sorry. You just broke the third commandment. We haven't even got there yet. What are you? A liar. You ever stolen something? Yeah. What do you call someone who steals things? A thief. What are you? I'm evidently a thief and a liar. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Oh, yes. All the time. More than 10 times a day. I'm not judging you guys. No, I <laughs> But by your own admission, you're lying thieves, blasphemers, and adulterers at heart. <laughs> I can enjoy my life however the f I decide to, and that's what I choose to do. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Yes, I have. Yeah, that's one of my favorite phrases, and I always use it. It's called blasphemy to use God's name as a cuss word. It's very serious in his eyes. I don't think this will help either. What's that? I don't think that will help anymore either. That's a uh, sign of the devil? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've done all the things that God tells me not to do. So I'm not judging you guys, but by your own admission, you both said you're lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterous at heart. And you have to face God on Judgment Day. If he judges you by the Ten Commandments, you're going to be innocent or guilty. Oh, dude, I broke like nine of ten. Yeah, and what about you? I plead the fifth. Are you going to be innocent or guilty? Uh, very likely guilty. Heaven or hell? I suppose hell. Hell is where I will go. Would you go to heaven or hell? I don't know, as far away from your God as possible. You're not a good person. You're like the rest of us. You're a lying thief, a blasphemer, and an adulterer at heart, by your own admission. I mean, I'd obviously be guilty unless he's, unless he's the worst judicial system I've ever seen. So what can you do to justify yourself, Chris? How can you escape the damnation of hell? Um, that's a good question. That's a good question. I, I don't know. I don't know if I have an answer to that question. I believe that God is so loving. I don't believe he would send someone to hell. So Hitler's got a little mansion in heaven. Six million Jews, men, women, and children mean nothing to God. So you believe in justice because you're made in the image of God. You're not like an animal, a cat, or a dog. Dogs don't care about justice and truth and retribution. Each year we spend trillions of dollars worldwide to see that justice is done. And that's because we're unique in creation. We're moral beings made in the image of God. Would you agree with that? Mm, yeah. 
I believe that the good I've done outweighs the bad I've done. Try that in a court of law. It doesn't work. If you've raped a woman and say, Judge, I give money to charities, he's not even going to take that into account. He's only going to take your crime into account. It's exactly the same with God. doesn't matter how much good you do, it's not going to wash away your sins. Man, we're talking about your eternal salvation. Where are you going to spend eternity? You're like a little kid who's holding a stick of dynamite, and it's sparkling, and he loves the sparkle. And I'm saying, toss it from you, toss it from you. The wages of sin is death. That's what the Bible says, the soul that sins it shall die. The thing that you delight in, your sins, is going to be the death of you, your most precious life. Does that concern you? Uh, a little bit. That's why I've been going to church. You know, if you saw me on the edge of a plane 10,000 feet up, and I was wearing a parachute that was really loose, I'm sure you'd tell me. Absolutely. Nathan, I'm telling you today, this is your salvation is loose. You've got to tighten things. I agree. There is one God. He's morally perfect and holy and just, and He's going to judge the world in righteousness on the day of judgment, and you and I both need a Savior, someone who can wash away our sins. Now, do you know what God did for guilty sinners so they wouldn't have to go to hell? He gave His only begotten Son, right? You need God's forgiveness, and God offers it through what Jesus did on the cross. Do you understand the legal implications of that? The legal implications? No, explain them. Well, the Bible says God is a judge. He's perfect and holy. You and I are criminals. We're sinners. We've violated His law, the Ten Commandments. We're heading for a place called hell, God's prison, without parole. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus stepped in and paid our fine in full. You and I broke God's law. Jesus paid our fine. That means God can legally dismiss your case. He can commute your death sentence and let you live forever because your fine was paid by another. You know, if you're in a court of law and you're guilty and someone pays your fine, the judge will say, Fine's paid, you're out of here. And that's what God can say of your crimes against His law. He can forgive you and He can let you live because of the suffering, death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Each of us have sinned, but the moment we come to Christ and are born again, God clothes us in what He calls righteousness so that He no longer sees our sins. That means He doesn't have to punish us with hell. He can grant us immortality. But what you have to do is repent of your sins. Don't confess them to a priest. Confess them and forsake them. That is, don't play the hypocrite and put your trust in Jesus Christ. The moment you do that, God will remit your sins, grant you everlasting life, and He'll give you a new heart with new desires, so you long to do the things that please Him and not the things of your own sinful desires. Does that make sense? That makes make sense. Yeah. yeah, it does, actually. Jesus said, Watch it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. Now we're making sense. I like that quote. Now we're making I like sense. That. that was excellent. I do like that. Makes sense what you're saying. That that ending just that was that, that, was, that was like yeah. the that was like the catalyst to like Real talk. that was the clicking point. Hey, you gonna think about this? I'm sure I will. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. I understand what you're saying. But but that's not it's not for me. Okay, I know that. Uh, that's why I'm talking to you. It took a lot for, for you to come here and talk to me and other people here. So, yeah, I'll think about it. I'm not going to lie, you you blew, you blew my brain, which is not in a, in a weird way, but, huh? Could you, say, could you explain what you mean by that? You you, you made real? you got to repent and trust in Christ. When are you going to do that? I don't. I can't an honestly answer that question. I don't know. Well, I can help you out. I'd say do it today. I mean, if you die in your sins, I might. There's two things you have to do to be saved. You've got to repent and trust alone in Jesus. When are you going to do that? Maybe tomorrow on church. Well, you don't have to wait till tomorrow because it may not come. You could die tonight in your sleep. We're talking serious stuff. And you don't have to do it in church. God dwells everywhere, just in the quietness of your heart. Say, God, please forgive my sins. Be truly contrite or sorry for your sins. And put your faith in Jesus like you trust a parachute. You know, when you jump out of a plane and trust a parachute, you don't trust your own arms. You don't try and fly. You only trust the parachute. And the Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust alone in Him. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. You don't know when you're going to die. 150,000 people die every 24 hours, and I'm saying there is a sense of urgency here. W would you be Would you be embarrassed if I pray with you? No, no. While respected Bible scholars may disagree on the timing of some of these signs, they all agree on one thing: that Jesus Christ is coming again. We didn't produce Noah to entertain you; we produced it in the sincere hope that you'd obey the gospel that you repent of your sins and trust alone in Jesus Christ so that we'll see you in heaven. Thank you so much for watching. Living Waters exists to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and to inspire and equip Christians in fulfilling the Great Commission. It's our aim to assist believers as they share their faith biblically and effectively. Please check out livingwaters.com where you'll find an array of books, free audio and video tools, an online school of biblical evangelism, gospel tracts, and many other helpful resources. And if you want to learn more about the gospel, we want to hear from you. Please visit livingwaters.com.
made, I will blot out from the face of the ground. But I will establish my covenant with you. Make yourself an ark, and this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be. Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous. Uh, I did leave that last part on because I know there are several of you that have seen it. There is actually, where is that again? Williamstown, Kentucky uh, is an actual life-size ark that's been built by the ministry Answers in Genesis. Incredible to see. One of the things that I guess I take away from this movie more than anything else is that God has spoken of this as, as Jesus had has also. The world does not just go on, but there is global warming coming. Full scale, absolute destruction and absolute confusion. And just remembering 9-11 this last week, it dawned on me that this destruction that was 18 years ago, as horrible as it was, could be just a foretaste of what is yet to come. But do you see what we're up against? Did you see these people that he talked to? I mean, do we just put, out our, put our proverbial head in the sand and pray that it goes away? No. No, friends, we don't do that. Because we know how the story ends. Those of us who have placed our trust in Jesus will not have to deal with the tribulation to come. Matthew 25 Verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come! You who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly, I say to you, as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but for the righteous into eternal life.
So God has given us a task while we're here on earth. A task to bring the good news to all who don't know him. To care for the sick, to comfort the downtrodden and the grieving, and to offer hope and salvation to the lost. So, where do you start? Where do we start? Jesus wants to be in relationship with you. It's not about church attendance, although that's not a bad thing. It's not about service, although that is important as well. It's not about offerings, although that is equally important. All good things, service, attendance, and offerings come from a genuine relationship with Christ. Any relationship requires time and energy, right? So where do we get off in giving Christ one hour a week? Would you do that with your spouse? Have you tried that with your spouse? How did it go? Jesus wants relationship. That's a two-way street. Our Sunday school class talked today about how we speak to God through prayer and he speaks to us through his word. And that's so true. If you haven't made that faith step yet, why not today? Why not now? As I pray this morning, ask God to enter your heart and your life, to redo your to-do list, and to step into the light of glory and victory. And I pray that you do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for these people that have come to hear your word. And Lord, I pray that if there are some out there that don't know you, that want a relationship with you, I would pray that you would uh, uh, bring them to you, bring them up, bring them forward uh, to, uh, to be able to, to enter into your glory. So for those that uh, don't know you, if you just pray, Lord, Jesus, I'm a sinner. You know, I know that I'm a sin, and I, and I have no future apart from you. So, Lord, you know, I place my trust in what you can do for me and, and what you did do for me on the cross. So uh, I place my life into your hands, and I, I uh, vowed to follow you for the rest of my days. And, Lord, if there's, if there's anyone who has thought of that or has said that prayer, I would pray, Lord, that you would strengthen and comfort, encourage them, and give them uh, hope and give them meaning, and give them new life. And Lord, for the rest of us, as we go out this week, as we look at uh, the different jobs and tasks that we have, let's not leave church behind. Let's not leave our lifestyle uh, here this morning behind. It is a lifestyle. It is a choice. It's a decision that we make. And that should be evident in our lives every single day. So Lord, we thank you. And I pray for those that uh, go out this week, uh, give them strength. Give them uh, uh, boldness to, to share your word. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing together?